My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather here today in the presence of our loving Heavenly Father, let us turn our hearts and minds to the Word of God, specifically to 2 Samuel 5, verse 24 to 26. This passage speaks to us of a critical moment in the life of King David, a man after God's own heart, and it offers profound insights for our own spiritual journey. As we delve into this scripture, we will see how David's physical battles mirror the spiritual warfare we face as followers of Christ. In this text, we find David engaged in yet another conflict with the Philistines. These persistent enemies of God's people serve as a poignant reminder that our Christian life, while filled with joy and peace in the Lord, is also characterized by constant spiritual warfare. Just as David could not rest on his laurels after one victory, we too must remain vigilant, for as the Apostle Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But take heart, beloved, for in this passage we see a beautiful picture of the Lord leading and David following. This, my friends, is the key to victory in our spiritual battles. Let us examine this truth more closely, for it holds the secret to living a victorious Christian life in a world that often seems set against us. First and foremost, we see in this text a prime necessity promised, the Lord's leading. David's unwavering dependence on God for victory is a model for us all. Before engaging in battle, David inquired of the Lord. He understood that without God going before him, any effort would be in vain. How often do we, in our haste or self-confidence, rush into situations without first seeking the Lord's guidance? David's example challenges us to cultivate a habit of dependence on God in every aspect of our lives. Consider for a moment the implications of this truth. In our fast-paced, self-reliant world, the idea of waiting on God's guidance can seem counterintuitive, even counterproductive. We're taught from a young age to be proactive, to take initiative, to make things happen. And while there's certainly a place for human effort and responsibility, David's example reminds us that true success, success that matters in the light of eternity, comes only when we align our efforts with God's will and timing. Think about the times in your own life when you forged ahead without seeking God's guidance. Perhaps it was a career decision, a relationship, or even a ministry opportunity. How did that work out? Now contrast that with the times when you've earnestly sought God's will, when you've waited for His leading before taking action. I'm willing to bet that the outcomes were vastly different. This dependence on God's leading is not just for our personal lives, but it is crucial in our mission to spread the gospel. As missionaries and evangelists, we must recognize that it is the Holy Spirit who prepares the hearts of people to receive the good news. Just as God often prepares the hearts of people in foreign lands before missionaries arrive, so too does He work in the lives of those around us before we share the gospel with them. Consider for a moment the countless testimonies of missionaries who have arrived in seemingly hostile territories, only to find that God had already been at work, softening hearts and creating a hunger for the truth. I'm reminded of the story of Adoniram Judson, one of the first American foreign missionaries. When he arrived in Burma, now Myanmar, in 1813, it seemed an impossible field. The Burmese were deeply entrenched in Buddhism and hostile to foreign religions. Yet, Judson persevered, trusting that God had gone before him. It took six years before he saw his first convert, but eventually, his work laid the foundation for a vibrant Christian community in Burma that continues to this day. These stories should fill us with confidence and joy. We are not alone in our efforts to share Christ. The Holy Spirit goes before us, preparing the way. This truth should embolden us in our witness. When we share the gospel with a friend, a family member, or a stranger, 
we can do so with the confidence that God may have already been at work in their heart, preparing them to receive the message of salvation. But it's not just the hearts of the listeners that need preparation. We, as the messengers of God's word, also need the Lord to go before us and prepare our hearts. Even the most eloquent preacher or the most experienced missionary can be out of harmony with God's message if they do not allow the Holy Spirit to work in them first. This is why prayer is so crucial before any attempt to share God's word. We must earnestly seek God's guidance and empowerment, acknowledging our utter dependence on Him. As Charles Spurgeon, that prince of preachers, once said, the smallest thing may put them out. O oh, shame upon us, that we who have such a message to deliver should be affected by such very little things. How true this is! Without God's preparation of our hearts, we can easily become distracted or discouraged by the smallest obstacles. But when we allow the Lord to lead us, to fill us with His Spirit and align our hearts with His, we become vessels fit for the Master's use. Think about it, my friends. How often have you felt inadequate to share your faith? How many times have you hesitated to speak up for Christ because you felt unprepared or unworthy? I want to encourage you today. Your adequacy does not come from yourself, but from God. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. When we rely on our own strength, our own wisdom, our own eloquence, we will inevitably fall short. But when we humble ourselves before God, acknowledging our weakness and dependence on Him, that's when He can use us most powerfully. It's in our weakness that His strength is made perfect. So before you engage in any spiritual endeavor, whether it's sharing your faith with a co-worker, teaching a Sunday school class, or embarking on a mission trip, take time to pray. Ask God to prepare your heart, to fill you with His Spirit, to give you the words to speak. And then step out in faith, trusting that He who called you will also equip you. Now, having established the necessity of God's leading, we come to the second crucial aspect of this passage, the consequent action commanded. Once God moves, His people must actively follow. Notice that when God promised to go before David, He did not tell David to sit back and relax. No, the command was clear, bestir yourself. In other words, get moving. This brings us to a common misconception that sometimes plagues the church. Some mistakenly believe that because God is sovereign and salvation is entirely His work, we need not act. They might say, if God has chosen someone for salvation, they will be saved regardless of what we do. But this is a grievous error. God's sovereignty does not negate our responsibility. Rather, it empowers and motivates our action. Spurgeon addressed this misconception powerfully when he said, the fact that God goes before us does not encourage us in sloth. Indeed, the knowledge that God is at work should spur us on to greater efforts in His service. Think of it this way. If a general told his soldiers that victory was guaranteed, would they become lazy and complacent? Of course not. They would be filled with courage and fight, with even greater vigor, knowing their efforts would not be in vain. In the same way, dear brothers and sisters, the assurance of God's work in salvation should make us all the more zealous in our evangelism. We can boldly proclaim the gospel, knowing that God is at work, drawing people to Himself. We can persevere in the face of opposition and discouragement, confident that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Consider the example of the Apostle Paul. He had a profound understanding of God's sovereignty in salvation. In Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 5, he writes, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, 
in accordance with his pleasure and will. Yet this belief in God's sovereign election did not lead Paul to inaction. On the contrary, it fueled his tireless efforts to spread the gospel. He traveled extensively, faced numerous hardships, and constantly put his life on the line to share the message of Christ. We see this same principle at work in the lives of great missionaries throughout history. William Carey, often called the father of modern missions, believed firmly in God's sovereignty. Yet he famously said, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. His belief in God's power and plan didn't lead him to passivity, but to bold action. He spent 41 years in India, translating the Bible into multiple languages and laying the groundwork for a Christian presence that continues to this day. So, what does this mean for us, dear friends? It means that we cannot use God's sovereignty as an excuse for inaction. Yes, salvation is God's work from start to finish. Yes, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and draws people to Christ. But God has chosen to use us as His instruments in this great work of redemption. We are called to be His ambassadors, to proclaim the message of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. This calls for action on our part. It means we must be intentional about sharing our faith. It means we must be willing to step out of our comfort zones, to engage with people who may be different from us, to face rejection and even persecution for the sake of the gospel. It means we must be diligent in prayer, persistent in our efforts to reach the lost, and faithful in our witness, both in word and deed. But here's the beautiful thing. We act not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. We move forward not in uncertainty, but with the confidence that God has gone before us. We labor not in vain, but with the assurance that God will use our efforts for His glory and the expansion of His kingdom. This brings us to the third aspect of our text, the hopeful sign afforded. For David, it was the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. This mysterious sound was a signal from God, indicating the right moment to attack. In our spiritual battles and in our efforts to advance God's kingdom, we too must be attuned to the signs of God's moving. What might these signs look like in our context? Spurgeon suggests several indicators that God is at work. First, we might notice an increased earnestness among God's people. When believers begin to yearn for revival, when there's a growing hunger for God's word and a deeper passion for prayer, these are signs that God is stirring his church to action. Think about the great revivals in history. Before the visible outpouring of God's Spirit, there was often a period of increased prayer and spiritual hunger among God's people. Before the Welsh Revival of 1904 to 1905, there were prayer meetings happening all over Wales. People were crying out to God for a move of His Spirit. When we see this kind of spiritual hunger and earnestness in the church, it's a sign that God may be about to do something significant. Another sign is the raising up of faithful, effective preachers of the Word. When God provides His church with leaders who boldly and clearly proclaim the truth of the gospel, it's often a precursor to spiritual awakening. Think of the great revivals throughout history. They were almost always preceded by and accompanied by powerful preaching of God's Word. Consider the first great awakening in America. God raised up preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield, whose powerful proclamation of the gospel sparked a revival that swept through the colonies. When we see God raising up men and women who preach His word with clarity, power, and conviction, it's often a sign that He's preparing to move in a mighty way. We might also see signs of God's moving in the response of unbelievers. When crowds gather to hear the gospel, when there's a growing interest in spiritual matters, even among those who don't yet know Christ, these can be indications that God is at work in a special way. Remember the story of Pentecost in Acts 2? The Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, 
and suddenly a crowd gathered, drawn by the commotion. Peter preached the gospel, and 3,000 people were saved that day. When we see unusual interest in spiritual things, even among those who are typically indifferent or hostile to the gospel, it may be a sign that God is preparing hearts for a harvest. But here's the crucial point, my friends. These signs are not just for our encouragement. They are calls to action. Just as the sound in the treetops was David's signal to attack, so too should these spiritual signs spur us to bold action for the kingdom of God. When we see these signs, how should we respond? First, we should respond with increased prayer. If we sense that God is stirring hearts and preparing for a move of His Spirit, we should intensify our prayers, asking God to pour out His Spirit in revival power. We should pray for the lost that God would open their hearts to the gospel. We should pray for ourselves and our fellow believers that God would empower us to be effective witnesses for Christ. Second, we should respond with increased evangelistic effort. If we see signs that God is preparing hearts to receive the gospel, we should redouble our efforts to share the good news. This might mean having more intentional conversations with our unsaved friends and family members. It might mean participating in organized outreach efforts in our communities. It might mean supporting missionaries who are taking the gospel to unreached people groups. Third, we should respond with expectant faith. If we truly believe that God is at work, we should step out in faith, expecting to see God move in powerful ways. This doesn't mean being presumptuous or reckless, but it does mean being willing to take risks for the sake of the gospel. It means being ready to obey God's leading, even when it doesn't make sense from a human perspective. This leads us to the final aspect of our text, the sure result following. We read that David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. David's obedience led to a decisive victory, and herein lies a powerful promise for us. When we follow God's leading, when we act in obedience to His commands, success is guaranteed. Now, we must be careful here. Success in God's economy often looks very different from worldly success. Our obedience may not always lead to visible results or immediate victories. But we can be confident that God is working out His purposes, even when we can't see it. Think about the ministry of the prophet Jeremiah. For decades, he faithfully proclaimed God's message to a stubborn and rebellious people. He saw little visible fruit from his ministry. In fact, he faced constant opposition, persecution, and discouragement. Yet from God's perspective, Jeremiah's ministry was a success because he was faithful to his calling. The impact of his ministry extended far beyond his lifetime, and his words continue to speak to us today. This is why Spurgeon encourages us to persevere in our spiritual labors, particularly in evangelism and prayer. He reminds us of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Our job is to faithfully plant and water, to share the gospel, to pray, to serve, and to trust God for the results. And if we don't see the results we hope for, Spurgeon's advice is powerful. We will go to his throne with tears and cries and say, Lord, thou hast changed the whole business. What hinders the blessing? And we will keep on crying to him and never let him go until he does bless us. What perseverance, what faith, this, my friends, is the attitude we must cultivate in our spiritual warfare and in our mission to reach the lost. Consider the example of George Miller, the great man of faith who cared for thousands of orphans in 19th century England. Miller was known for his remarkable prayer life and his unwavering faith in God's provision. When faced with needs, he would pray and wait on God, often seeing miraculous answers to his prayers. But there were also times when the answers didn't come immediately. In those times, Miller didn't give up. He continued to pray, to believe, to act in faith. And in the end, God always provided. 
This is the kind of persevering faith we need in our spiritual battles. When we don't see immediate results from our evangelistic efforts, when our prayers seem to go unanswered, when the revival we long for doesn't come, we must not give up. We must continue to pray, to believe, to act in obedience to God's commands. For we have the assurance that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Remember, dear friends, that God's timing is not our timing. His ways are higher than our ways. What seems like delay or defeat to us may be part of God's perfect plan. Our job is not to determine the outcome, but to be faithful in our obedience. As we do so, we can trust that God is at work, even when we can't see it. As we draw this message to a close, I want to make a personal appeal to each one of you. To my fellow believers, I urge you to be alert to the signs of God's moving. Are you sensing a stirring in your spirit, a growing burden for the lost, a deeper hunger for God's word? These may be the rustle in the treetops, God's signal for you to bestir yourself and take action for his kingdom. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Don't say, I'm not qualified, or I'm too busy. Remember, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And he has called each one of us to be his witnesses, to make disciples of all nations. So whether it's sharing your faith with a neighbor, volunteering in a ministry, or supporting missionaries, find ways to actively participate in God's mission. Consider the words of Jesus in Matthew 9, verse 37, 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. My friends, we are those workers. The harvest is ready, but God is waiting for us to respond to his call. Will you answer that call today? Perhaps you're thinking, but I don't know what to say. I'm not eloquent like some preachers I've heard. Take heart. God doesn't require eloquence, only obedience. Remember Moses? When God called him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses protested, saying he was slow of speech. But God used him mightily, not because of his eloquence, but because of his obedience. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm too old. Surely God can use someone younger and more energetic. But consider Caleb in the Bible. At 85 years old, he was still ready to take on new challenges for God. Age is not a barrier to God's use. Willingness is the key. Perhaps you feel disqualified because of past failures or sins. But remember Peter, who denied Jesus three times, yet was restored and became a bold leader in the early church. God specializes in using imperfect people to accomplish His perfect will. The truth is, dear friends, that God can use anyone who is willing to be used. He's not looking for ability, but for availability. He's not seeking perfection, but surrender. Will you make yourself available to Him today? Now let me speak directly to those who may be here today who don't yet know Christ personally. If you're feeling any stirring in your heart as you've heard this message, any sense of God's Spirit drawing you, don't ignore it. This may be God's special invitation to you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Respond to God's call today. You might be thinking, but you don't know what I've done. Surely God couldn't want someone like me. Let me assure you, based on the authority of God's word, that God loves you deeply and personally. Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to clean up your life before coming to God. Come as you are and let him transform you by his grace. Or perhaps you're hesitating because you're afraid of what following Christ might cost you. It's true that following Jesus isn't always easy. He himself said in Luke 9 verse 23, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. But let me assure you, 
Whatever you might give up for Christ pales in comparison to what you gain in Him. As the Apostle Paul said, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3 verse 8. So I invite you, right where you are, to open your heart to Christ. Acknowledge your need for Him, confess your sins, and ask for His forgiveness. Invite Him to be the Lord of your life. The Bible promises, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9. In conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, let us take to heart the lessons from David's example. Let us cultivate a deep dependence on God, always seeking His guidance before we act. Let us be ready to move when God moves, not falling into the trap of passive Christianity. Let us be alert to the signs of God's working around us, and let us respond with bold, obedient action. And let us persevere in our spiritual labors, Trusting that, as we faithfully plant and water, God will surely bring the growth. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There may be times when we feel discouraged, when we don't see the results we hope for. But we must not lose heart. Our God is faithful and He will accomplish His purposes through us as we remain faithful to Him. Consider the example of William Carey once again. He labored for seven years in India before seeing his first convert. Many would have given up, but Carey persevered. By the end of his life, he had translated the Bible into numerous Indian languages, established a college, and laid the foundation for a Christian presence that continues to this day in India. What if he had given up after the first year or the fifth year? How many souls would have been lost? How much kingdom work would have been left undone? The same is true for us, dear friends. We may not see the full impact of our faithfulness in this lifetime, but we can be assured that God is using our obedience, our prayers, our witness to accomplish His eternal purposes. Every act of obedience, every word spoken for Christ, every prayer offered in faith is being used by God in ways we may never fully understand this side of eternity. So let us be faithful in the small things and the big things. Let us be diligent in prayer, persistent in sharing the gospel, unwavering in our commitment to Christ. Let us encourage one another in the faith, spurring each other on to love and good deeds. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May we, like David, be able to say that we did as the Lord commanded us, and may we see in our generation a mighty move of God that brings multitudes into his kingdom. To him be all the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the powerful lessons it teaches us. We acknowledge our complete dependence on you. Lead us, Lord, as you led David. Help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's promptings and bold in our obedience. Give us eyes to see the signs of your moving and hearts ready to respond. Use us, Lord, in the advancement of your kingdom. May we be faithful in planting and watering, always trusting you for the growth. We pray for those among us who don't yet know you personally. Draw them to yourself, we pray. Open their hearts to receive the good news of your love and salvation. For those who have recommitted their lives to you today, strengthen them in their resolve. Help them to grow in their faith and become powerful witnesses for you. Lord, we pray for revival in our land. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Awaken your church. Bring conviction of sin and a hunger for righteousness. Use us, Lord, as instruments of your peace and agents of your kingdom. We pray for our missionaries around the world. Protect them 
provide for them, and powerfully use them to bring the light of the gospel to dark places. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now, Lord, as we go from this place, may we go with the confidence that you go before us. May we be bold in our witness, steadfast in our faith, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you leave this place today, my dear brothers and sisters, may you go with the peace of God that passes all understanding. May you be strengthened in your inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.